um, a nomenclature commission, and back then, 65 years ago, a commission on crystallographic data. And this was at a time, not quite before computers had been invented, but certainly before what we now recognize as the, the information age, when nowadays data is almost synonymous with computer processing. Um, I won't go through the other details on the timeline because uh, that's sort of reproduced in the program booklet as well, other than just to comment that it's consistently throughout this long history had a number of initiatives and, uh, and projects to address and this, this very important um, um, aspect of science, of performing science. So I approach this introduction by presenting to you a paradigm for scientific communication. It's not necessarily uh, applicable everywhere, but there are certain practices within science for which this is appropriate. You come along and you frame a hypothesis. To test the hypothesis, you perform some experiment. That experiment typically generates raw data that you have to reduce or process in order to make sure that it's in a form proper for your onward analysis. From that uh, reduced data, uh, you apply some thought. You derive a model. And if you're a good scientist, you validate that model. You look at how the model informs or flows from your hypothesis and the experiment and so on. Uh, and that might cause you to repeat the experiment. There, there's a sort of feedback loop here. But eventually you converge on a model which you consider to be uh, the one that you want to go forward with and uh, convey to your colleagues. Traditionally you do that by submitting a paper in a scholarly journal. That paper is subject to peer review. And the purpose of the peer review is that one of your peers independently uh, gives some thought as to the validity of the model that you, uh, that you propose. And in the more or less traditional cycle, uh, that's the extent of the loop. Uh, typically, uh, a reviewer is not able to penetrate further back and assess the quality of the data from which you derive the model. So in some sense, he's relying upon your interpretation and looking at the, the, the reasonableness and self-consistency of that model. If the peer is satisfied, you go on to publish the article, and the article... Uh, communicates your findings, your, your views, your, um, your new theory. And ideally, uh, you would like the supporting data for that to be disseminated to the wider community. And I put that in brackets because the recognition of, of the importance of that is only relatively slowly seeping out into the general scholarly communication environment. So if we apply this paradigm to some aspects of our science, to an X-ray structure determination, for example, uh, the hypothesis might have something to do with uh, relating structure to function uh, within a pharmaceutical environment. Uh, a typical experiment will be an X-ray diffraction experiment from a single crystal or a powder sample. And from that, the raw data is typically in the form of images, uh, a data set typically is of order a gigabyte in size. It's quite a significant amount of, a significant quantity of computer storage. As technology improves, uh, the volumes involved will only increase. Uh, but in the process of reducing your data uh, to generate the structure factors on which your refinement will be based, uh, you, in fact, uh, reduce the volume of data as well. And um, in recent years, this has become a very manageable quantity a few megabytes perhaps of data that can be carried along quite easily in a computer environment. Uh, typically um, the derivation of the model leads to a molecular or crystal structure and within our community uh, we actually have automated processes which allow you to validate that model against a set of objective criteria uh, that give you a handle on how reasonable, how self-consistent your model has been. Again, within our community, we have adopted the practice uh, that's now well established that we will submit the paper to certain of the uh, IUCR journals in SIF format. Uh, that includes all the, uh, the data at the level of describing the model, and typically uh, it will also include the structure factors in the way in which our journals uh, work. 
Uh, the peer review process uh, includes that uh, aspect of validation. It includes the output from Chexif. It also includes the ability to search for databases for prior um, refinements or, or similar structures. And so you have a, a rather rich part of the, uh, of the pathway that you traverse here. And in doing that, um, you eventually get to publish the article. And the article can uh, be disseminated in forms that people are comfortable with as a PDF or um, on the web as HTML. Um, but we also, within our journals, um, we uh, publish the SIF so that the data also finds its way into the wider community as part of that publication process. And uh, we therefore transmit onwards the, uh, the data um, in the form of the deposited material. Um, the journals do it as uh, supplementary core SIF files. Uh, MM SIF files or PDB format are available for protein depositions in the, uh, in the PDB. And so we're conforming uh, in a very full way to this, this general framework that I've outlined. And you'll notice that uh, most of this pathway is in bold type. Um, so because of the uh, effort we've put into providing standard tools, we're actually able to traverse uh, this pathway backwards and forwards very effectively. Uh, this allows us to construct a schematic. I'm not going to go through this in detail because it's, uh, it's a picture that might come up a couple of times later in the course of the day. Um, but through our standardization efforts, uh, there are possibilities for taking uh, data all the way through from the raw data to through the various uh, reduction and processing stages uh, within the laboratory through to publication, to deposition in databases, and to publication from the journals or redistribution publication from the databases. It's a very rich, it's a very full uh, pathway. Um, it's what I've characterized in the title of the talk as a coherent information flow. And it's one that as a community we're very fortunate to be able to support. Now in mentioning that uh, this is um, sorry, I think the feedback's coming from here again. So this, if you locate my browser and close it. Um, so a lot of this um, has been um, directly attributable to SIF, to the crystallographic framework that ComSIF has, has overseen. Um, but there have also been a number of standardization efforts that have worked alongside SIF to provide this coherent overview. Uh, SIF itself dates from 1991 when the initial standard was published as a paper, even then quite a substantial paper of some 30 pages, I think, in extent. Uh, but in the time since then, the documentation for SIF has grown somewhat so that the, the current user manual is quite a hefty tome. Um, there's a lot of reading, but we've tried to make it uh, easily readable, um, even to non-specialists. But the significance of this book is not just its heft, but the fact that it's part of the international tables. So this is the, the standard reference series that crystallographers look to to define their subjects. And I think it's highly significant that the Union has chosen to dedicate an entire volume of that series to the whole business of data representation, definition, and exchange. Uh, SIF started life as a, um, as a format description, a very simple description, a human-readable ASCII-based file with a very simple and lightweight syntax. And that will be familiar to many of you who, uh, who use it uh, to submit structures directly to some of our journals. But from the outset, um, we made the design decision that within the format, tags such as this that define particular quantities were not defined as part of the format specification, but the definitions were externalized. So the semantics of those tags were defined very carefully in another place. In fact, in machine-readable files that had the same format as SIF, which was very interesting because it allowed the same software to process the data, but also to refer back to the definitions and pick up machine-readable attributes of the definitions. And this was a very foresighted um, design approach. 
Uh, the community, uh, I think, rapidly saw the benefits of this level of standardization. And within five years of its introduction, we were able to mandate the SIF as the, um, as the only allowable submission format for one of our journals. And it is, of course, um, a format that's accepted for the deposition of uh, material across all the journals. So the editorial in 1996 uh, brought this news to the world. Seems a long time ago now. Um, but reflect that the, uh, the web itself, the HTML, was released to the, to the wider community only around about 1994. So, and we had SIF going a few years before that. Um, so we were you know, re really leading the curve even then. And not long after that, um, the PDB, the Protein Data Bank, which is this uh, enormously valuable repository of biological structures, um, it, uh, it was re-engineered under the uh, curatorship of the Research Collaboratory for Structural Biology and to accommodate both the growing volume of data and complexity of the structures that they were uh, required to, um, to store and to, to handle, um, they adopted an extended SIF format uh, that was designed to be future-proof and to accommodate the enormous growth that, in fact, we have seen come to pass in the decade or so since then. Notice, by the way, that um, organizationally, the PDB has, in the last 10 years, been formed of a, a worldwide consortium of, uh, of organizations, and that to maintain their information in synchronicity, uh, they actually transfer material between themselves uh, using an XML carrier format. But the structure of that XML schema maps completely onto the MMSIF definitions, onto the semantic ontology. Um, and this is really just illustrating the fact that though SIF started with a particular concrete file format, that's not an essential or indeed the most important aspect of what we've done. Uh, then again, not long after that, a need was perceived for standardizing uh, the formats in which um, uh, diffraction images were collected from a, a multiplicity of vendors. And a workshop took place uh, in the late 90s um, to work towards a standard, an extension of SIF, an image SIF, and a binary equivalent of that that would be able to handle uh, diffraction images effectively and efficiently. And here's a, a photograph of the workshop at Brookhaven that, that presaged that. And a number of the faces here um, are also present in the room today. So you had this, this momentum building towards standardization, towards moving towards more complex and larger data that all fitted into the SIF framework. And in more recent times, uh, people have begun to uh, ask the question, now that we're dealing with these large volumes of, uh, of experimental data, um, should the union be uh, systematizing uh, the way in which those are collected, stored, disseminated, reused within the community? And a couple of years ago, uh, the executive committee of the union um, called uh, or convened a working group to, to address this, to look at the problems of standardization that underpin a desire to recommend or perhaps one day mandate routine diffraction of, uh, of experimental data. Uh, that working group isn't under the remit of COMSIFS, but I included in this series because it does overlap very much with what we're trying to do in this coherent framework. And some of you, I think, will remember that we ran a workshop in Bergen at last year's ECM um, to, uh, to chew over many of the uh, management issues involved at that time. And Round about, well, slightly before that, uh, a number of us were also involved in a series of open access publications that we've made available through ICSTI uh, to inform our own community, certainly, but the, the wider world of many of the, the ramifications um, of, this, of this type of exercise. And in recent times, indeed in the last two days just before this symposium, a group of us from COMSIFS have run a workshop on the premises here in order to look at how you can refine still further uh, the, uh, the value of the dictionary framework. And um, 
one of the things that we've been looking at is extensions to the formalism so that where previously um, we defined a particular quantity with a small piece of text and a few constraints on units or other attributes. Now we think it would be possible to build into the dictionary definition machine readable and ultimately machine executable uh, algorithms which will relate a particular datum, a particular uh, concept expressed as data um, to other data items uh, within the same file, allowing you again to validate, to check the self-consistency of, um, of the file, of the data in that file. They will allow you to query a file and to retrieve the reflection calculated phase if it is not present in the file, but quantities from which it may be derived are located elsewhere in the file. Um, and it also has the potential in the long term of actually defining algorithmically a lot of the quantities that are embedded in computer programs and data processing and so forth. Uh, and that therefore, um, this extends the meanings that as humans we embed in, in these little textual descriptions into the execution environment within computer code. It's a very exciting prospect and you'll hear a little bit more later in the day about what potential that might open up into the future. And uh, it was a fun workshop. I think uh, we, all, we all worked very hard, but uh, I think we came away with a, a feeling that we were moving forward and uh, achieving a lot. And that though ComSIFS has been around for 20 years, um, it still has a lot of work to do and a lot of, uh, of impetus behind it. And part of the reason I'm here addressing this youthful audience of people from the more general fields of crystallography who will wander in during uh, the course of the day and hear more of the details of this approach is that uh, we want you to appreciate that ComSIFS isn't simply a dry and dusty little committee uh, of grey-bearded old fogies. Um, but it's central to <laughs> the comment, yes it is, wasn't picked up by the mic happily, so the wider world didn't get to hear that. Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's a very vigorous activity at the center of much that's important and still rapidly uh, evolving within crystallography. So there are lots of ways in which the younger generation can become involved with these activities should you choose to do so. So if I just go back fleetingly to the, uh, to the framework I outlined at the beginning, um, the idea with the DDLM extensions is that you carry the ontology all the way through this paradigm so that right from your, um, from your actual uh, hypothesis to publication of all the associated supporting evidence and back, you can traverse this fore and aft as effectively as you want. We have been involved in the project for over 20 years. A large number of people have been involved either directly with ComSIFs or in projects that uh, we've received their input. I'm not going to read the slide. I've probably forgotten a lot of other names for whom I apologize. It wasn't a deliberate slight. Um, but you'll see it's something that an enormous cross-section of the community has already contributed to. And we, we look forward to, uh, to extending that community further. And finally, I just wish to thank the organizations who have sponsored today's activities. They have made it possible. They have made the, the streaming and recording possible. There are a lot of familiar names in the crystallographic world, CCDC, Protein Data Bank, some of the uh, equipment vendors. There are also some possibly slightly surprising uh, contributors, the Digital Curation Center, British Library, CoData. These are all organizations that we've worked with very closely in recent years and have expressed a great interest in what we're doing. So thank you for your attention. I have a news report. <laughs>